Hey there, so, <clears throat> sorry I had, didn't have time to get to this earlier, but I uh, figured the video is just the fastest way to get through this. Uh, so question one, uh, when you first start experimenting with RFID implants, uh, very excited. Um, any fears about making the leap and doing the actual implant? Uh, no, not really, actually. The, um, the thought just kind of occurred to me that the pets have been getting these things for a long time, and it wasn't really an issue because, I mean, there were problems, then the pets would... Obviously, there would have been issues with pets, and it would have come up, and it would have been, uh, you know, discontinued or updated or whatever. So, I mean, uh, really, the the idea of fear around putting something in the body is kind of a strange one because it it centers around how you consider the body. Is it a spiritual vessel or not? And I kind of covered that in the TED talk, but um, but really, it, it's odd how people don't have any problems, you know considering doing an ear piercing or, you know, uh, if, you know, if you're not into ear piercing, but doing something like a, like a dental implant, like I have a dental implant in my upper jaw, and, uh, you know, some kind of medical implant, people don't really get squeamish about that kind of thing. They might be squeamish about the procedure, but not the idea or the concept of doing it. Um, it's very common people do it. I think just the novelty uh, of this particular type of device going in the body makes people a little bit squeamish. Um, but no, I had, I had no fear at all, just, um, you know, it was a very natural thought to just be like, oh, that's, that's a great idea, I could, I could do that, and then just, it was done before I really have any, had any time to really think about it, um, so yeah. What are the reaction of friends and family? So, uh, friends and family, really, uh, the initial reaction was, what? It was kind of like, wh why did you do this? And, um, I think they they didn't understand the technology, so they didn't understand why anybody would re even bother with it. Um, you know, if somebody puts an earring in or something that looks a certain way, people get it because they think it's aesthetic, you know. But this, they didn't, because they didn't understand the purpose of it or the function, they didn't really uh, identify with why somebody would want to do it. It would be kind of equivalent to them of, hey, I put a rock under my skin. You know, I went out in the yard and picked a rock up and I had it surgically implanted and it'd be like, why? So. Um, it was kind of the same concept. Um, so beyond that, um, family members that had, uh, you know, religious background were concerned about, you know, Mark of the Beast kind of stuff. The Christian background religion, uh, Book of Revelation talks about Mark of the Beast, and and you know, I I listened to them, uh, their complaints about it, and you know, politely said okay, you know, but it didn't really uh, matter to me. But you know, really, there were, it was all about age limits. So anybody, you know younger than 30, or, you know, 40 or whatever, they thought it was cool. Anybody older than that was like, oh my god, what, what are you doing? Um, I mean, it's not exact line, but you know, it's in there. So 20-somethings and below were like, great, this is cool, what does it do? What can you do? People over that are like, oh, better watch out. So, it's kind of interesting. Uh, take the next step, written a book, sort of company. Most surprising things clients have come up with. You know, uh, a lot of people ask me about one of the surprising things people have done, and I always draw a blank, but I, I was uh, I was thinking about this the other day, and this guy, Mikey Sklar, uh, he's a really creative dude, really really cool guy. Um, he ha he built this um, thing he calls the highlighter, and you can look up Sklar highlighter, and uh, <clears throat> it's basically a trampoline with uh, flamethrowers, not under it, but next to it, and when you jump on the trampoline and it bends down, there's a sensor, a proximity sensor, and as it gets closer, the flames go higher, so it like shoots up flames, and um, obviously a very dangerous device, and so he put authentication on it, and he uses the implant to turn it on. So unless you can, you know, unless he turns it on with his implant, there's no fire. So that's a really awesome use, I think, of, uh, of the technology, beyond like getting, getting in the house and doing all that kind of common stuff. Um, Mentioned doctors resistant to the idea of assisting with implantation. Concerns have validity. So, question number four. Uh, basically, do I think doctors, the concerns that doctors raise have any validity? And how does dangerous things help bridge the gap towards safe modification practices? So, doctors, uh, the, the objections that doctors have aren't really based on a technical grounds of, they're, they're not concerned about the device itself they're more concerned about how implanting that device, the act of implanting that device, fits into their uh, healthcare 
matrix of risk assessment, meaning they're more concerned about liability issues and putting at risk their license or putting at risk their, uh, their uh, malpractice insurance coverage than they are with the actual procedure itself. So time and time again, when it, when it comes to medical doctors or nurses, RNs, or any, anybody in the medical profession performing this very simple implantation procedure, it usually comes down to whether or not they have uh, a really good rapport with the person. They know the person, the person knows them. That, you know, uh, People that have kind of grown up with the same family doctor, for example, usually don't have a problem. But if you just walk into any old clinic off the street, and you're like, hey, I want to put this computer chip in my hand, uh, usually the doctor's like, you're nuts, and no way. So that's usually what happens. Um, granted, you know, a lot of doctors, even if they do know their their client, you know, their their patient really well, they still don't feel comfortable. And typically, that because that's because either they have a really oppressive, uh, you know, malpractice insurance situation, or they're just unwilling or unable to do the research to research the device fully, um, stuff like that. So. When, I, when people ask to go to the doctor, I usually send them armed with a waiver form that I've written that you know, absolves the doctor of all liability as best as we could do it. And I've had that run through uh, my lawyer to try to make it as legalese as possible. Um, but also, you know, come with information about the device, the FDA approval for the Verichip device, which is very similar. Um, you know, kind of everything that you could possibly bring in an arsenal. Uh, to convince the doctor that, hey, this is totally safe, I absolve you of all liability, blah, 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 blah. And sometimes that works. Um, but when it doesn't work, you know, really, uh, body piercing is the next level. So piercers the world over are jabbing people with needles, putting things in the body that protrude from the skin and, and really cause uh, a prolonged healing period. So you've got a, a piece of metal that protrudes from the skin, it's going to take a while to, to heal. You know, it's not going to heal o overnight, and that actually increases the risk of, of uh, infection and all kinds of things. So compared to a general, even an ear piercing, putting one of these devices in the skin and then removing the needle so that it closes, uh, it's actually much better. Uh, it's a much safer thing than just putting an earring in. So the risk of infection is much lower. The wound heals much faster. So it just seemed like a natural fit to, to try to build a partner network um, that we've started doing. So globally we have piercers that we've uh, partnered with that are you know, proven piercers, they have safe uh, uh, locations and, and uh, they follow safe practices um, and uh, we send a little training guide out to them on how to orient the tag, how to put it in. We have multiple piercing procedures that they can choose from so something is called a single point piercing which is just a needle goes in, deposits, removes and it is just one puncture wound. There's something more typical which is a multi-point or two-point uh, piercing which is you know, typical of an ear piercing where it goes all the way through. Um, so depending on the legalities in the area, they might have to use a, a multi-point piercing or they might be able to get away with a single point. Um, but yeah, so building that network of knowledgeable body modification artists and professionals is really kind of key to making this a little more accessible uh, in a safe way to, to hacker types. Uh, large population afraid of RFID technology. Spokesperson movement. Hmm. Have I ever felt threatened? So question five is about have I ever felt threatened as a kind of the spokesman for this type of body modification? And um, the answer is yes. Uh, I mean, I, I have been threatened. I haven't really felt threatened by it. Maybe a couple times I felt threatened, but uh, the very first threat I got was uh, days after kind of the story broke uh, in 2005, after I got my first implant in my right hand, or my left hand rather. Um, I got an email that was just large font that says, you are the devil's mouthpiece. And that was it. And uh, I kind of laughed a little bit. But, um, but yeah, since then, I've had a few direct death threats, uh, many indirect death threats. Indirect being an article comes out, comments below the article that say something akin to, these people should be rounded up and killed or whatever. Um, the article's about me, so I'm assuming they meant me. But um, So anyway, that kind of stuff has happened, and it kind of died down. Um, it hasn't really cropped up. I, I also get a lot of people contacting me thinking that they've been implanted against their will and they have implants and they're hearing voices and um, you know obviously some mentally ill uh, people out there um, but you know I always reply uh, politely and I say you know, the first thing you need to do if you think you have an implant in you is go get an x-ray here's my x-ray here's what it looks like it's very easy to identify 
any radiography place should be able to take an x-ray and see it. Um, so go do that. And so far, nobody's ever come back with, you know, I found one. So kind of interesting. Uh, <clears throat> describe the future you'd like to see in regards of augmented humanity. That's a, that's a big one. Um, the future that I would like to see is kind of one where there's kind of an ultimate freedom in terms of cognitive and personal augmentation, both genetically, technologically, like electronic hardware, computing hardware, interface hardware. Um, communications has always been kind of paramount to, to massive, you know, human expansion and, and you know, technical expansion, personal communications, um, you know, so, uh, evolution of societies depended heavily on communications. Um, the first telegraph lines, you know, crisscrossing the, the country and then the globe, it opened up a whole world of communication that was just instantaneous and, and amazing, like nobody had ever seen that before. Radio communications does the same thing. Telephone and internet, it's all, you know, the, the idea that we can be able to, you know, communicate with anybody at this, at, at a moment's notice. Um, there's a anthropolog cyborg anthropologist, uh, Amber Case, who, uh, I really uh, I like her work. So she talks about uh, ambient intimacy and the idea that we all have these smartphones in our pockets. We can pull them out at any time, contact any of our friends at any at a moment's notice. Um, it gives a sense of ambient intimacy where, if that cell phone is gone, you feel lost. You feel disconnected because you don't have that option anymore. It's not about communicating with everybody all the time. It's about having the option, always feeling that person's close. And so uh, I think in terms of augmentation, eventually it's going to get to the point where we can just think about a person and be able to have a more uh, intimate connection with them at any time without having to pull out this device and then use this really bad interface. So that's going to be a very interesting thing. Um, but I think in terms of general human augmentation, I mean, you know, eventually, and I'm going way out here, but eventually the sun's going to explode. We need to be able to get to a place where we can control our genetic destiny to a point where spacefaring, living on the moon, living on Mars, living outside of our solar system, living outside of our galaxy maybe, um, and getting there, traveling that great distance, um, is possible. So being able to free ourselves from our evolutionary you know, end point right now to, to be able to kind of engineer our own uh, existence, that's, that's going to be critical. And doing so in a framework that you know, ensures that you know, we don't destroy ourselves in the process. I mean, we've always thought that, you know, that uh, nuclear warfare was going to, you know, have this huge possibility of wiping us all out, and now that the, the, the face of the devil has changed a little bit, and now there's worries that, you know, we're going to destroy ourselves through, it used to be gray goo for, for nanotechnology, and now it's, you know, I don't know what their term is yet, but it's, you know, bio, biohacking based or, you know, changing some kind of a GMO based uh, doomsday machine that uh, releases some kind of smart DNA protein against us or something. But uh, yeah, so controls have to be put in place and you know, I, I, I picture a time when we're gonna have, you know, antivirus on the computer but also antivirus nano systems inside ourselves that can protect us from, you know, rogue proteins or, you know, uh, enemy DNA, that kind of stuff. I mean, I kinda, I can see that uh, as a possibility in the future. So uh, it'll be very interesting. So that's it.